right, so good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And I want to do a special shout out to all our teachers today. Again, this is our first week back as an organization. We are 10 programs into our 50 this month alone. And so thank you guys if you've joined us in the past. We did 550 plus programs last year featuring scientists and explorers around the planet. It is so nice to have you back to showcase their stories and amazing people and places worldwide. So thank you. And kids, welcome back to the classroom. It's so exciting to have you guys back. It makes these programs so, so much more fun. Now today we are uh, beginning our first program in a Gerder Awards series. Now we've been partnering with them for over a year now. The Gerder Awards celebrate and showcase some of the best people in biomedical and health research on the planet. People that go on to win Nobel Prizes, people who are at the cutting edge of their field. And so it's a real thrill today to have a lot of uh, grade eights, high schoolers here today to learn from one of the top scientists we have on the broadcast, and that is Dr. Rodolphe Berengu. So he is at North Carolina State University where he works as a food scientist, in particular around CRISPR as a technology. So if you haven't heard of CRISPR, you'll be blown away by the end of this broadcast. If you have, it is one of the most unique and amazing tools and techniques that we have in science nowadays. This is something that did not exist when I was a kid. It's in the last you know, decade or less, uh, and is the most powerful genetic technology we have ever had to reshape life on Earth and reshape all sorts of cool things. So from a food science perspective, we're gonna get a chance to hear about that today. Again, this is part of our Gardner Award series. Do check out their website when you're done this broadcast. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Berenger. Thank you so much for joining us today, man. Great. Thank you, Jesse. And uh, <clears throat> indeed, good, uh, good afternoon, good morning to everyone here. I'm excited to be here. And as Jesse mentioned, uh, CRISPR, if you haven't heard of it yet, uh, now is a good day to do it. If you haven't used it yet, hopefully in your classroom, you won't just hear about it, maybe even play with it and tinker with it and explore with it. Uh, we're going to explore by the seat of our pants today. And, and as mentioned, there may be no more compelling, no more timely, no more amazing, no more disruptive, no more controversial uh, technology on planet Earth right now than CRISPR. What I'm going to do today is introduce you to CRISPR, talk a little bit about genome editing, because we can alter the genomes of virtually any species you can think of on planet Earth, and talk a little bit about food science, because I'm a food scientist, and some of the products that will come to the market will really impact us from a food science standpoint. And again, I'm thankful for the, the Canada Gerner Awards to give us a chance to do it and connect today. So I'm gonna talk for about 30 minutes to make sure we have enough time for questions from all of you. I'm a scientist. I hope and I'm actually confident that some of you will become scientists in due time. You may even be scientists already and be known to you. And what we do as scientific innovators is turn science occasionally to technology, CRISPR science to CRISPR tech, and then hopefully that technology can be useful enough to be applied. We're going to use CRISPR technology to do genome editing. And then hopefully those applications will eventually lead to some actual products that are useful and valuable, whether you're a patient, a consumer, a customer, an investor, or a high schooler or a middle schooler. And now more than ever, uh, it's very important to understand that science is great, technology is great, but unless there's acceptance by regulators, and or acceptance by the public, science can only go so far. And this is why academics like me and industry people like my former life and governmental agencies and society and media and educators and students all are part of that amazing puzzle and we all need to really fit in together. So a few quick things you need to know about CRISPR and don't worry too much about the data. I'm gonna articulate everything you need to know and understand. As Jesse mentioned, in the last nine years, CRISPR has revolutionized the world. This is a technology that's been disseminated right now to 200,000 labs across the globe in over 100 countries, including, of course, the US, Canada as the top 10 countries. And there's about 50,000 authors from 45 different, 4,500 different groups that have published at least one paper on the topic. And as a matter of fact, not only is CRISPR disseminated across the globe, it's democratized in many ways, but the top 10 countries are as follows. NAFTA, right? The US is there, Canada is there. And then of course, China is catching up. Ironically enough, we go as far as Japan and as far as Australia in the top 10. And five of those top 10 countries are in Europe. So most countries are players and most countries who aspire to be technical leaders in the space are actually a top 10 player in the space. And there's many things you can do with CRISPR. The bottom line is that about 95% of all 
CRISPR scientists, all CRISPR papers, all CRISPR applications are focused on human health. But there's a lot more that we can do with CRISPR than human health. So make sure your volumes are up. I'm going to play a two-minute video for you to show you where we are right now with CRISPR technologies. Mother Nature gave us something that's richer than our imagination. We saw a very peculiar pattern. Never seen anything like this before. I remember him saying, remember this word, CRISPR. You can actually use CRISPR to change DNA. David's doctor told me, just hold on, there's something coming. We've never had the ability to change the fundamental chemical nature of who we are, and now we do. And what do we do with that? Our pig is the most advanced general modified animal running on the earth. My lab has been accused of taking science fiction and turning it into science fact. I consider that very high praise. We could engineer a single gene that could potentially make us all more muscular. But should we make that universally available? Many people find what we're doing to be disturbing or they're not ready for it. Should we really be manipulating the heredity of future generations given our lack of knowledge about so many things? I don't know where you draw the line between not having albinism and deciding your kid needs to be an extra foot taller so they can be a good oarsman and go to Yale. Where is that line? Who's going to draw that? Anything that will stop my child from suffering, I'm for. You know, draw this ethical line wherever you want, but don't draw it in front of my disease. Humans are very good at inventing things, but they're very, very bad at working out what the implications are. The balance of nature is built of a series of interrelationships between living things and between living things and their environment. Often you don't realize that you're in the middle of a revolution until after the revolution has occurred. You just heard it. Often you don't realize you're in the middle of revolution until after the revolution has occurred. And because you're here today and you just watched this, you should actually go on Netflix and watch Human Nature, obviously. Very educational, very interesting, very thought provoking. We are witnessing in real time a revolution. And it's a technological revolution. So the science of CRISPR, I'm not going to go too much into what CRISPR is, is an adaptive immune system in bacteria that kind of works like a phone. And it enables bacteria to take a genetic picture of a virus, of an invasive genetic element, and capture it as a short piece of DNA right here. And then it can control F in the subsequent case of an infection, find it cleave it and protect itself against it. It's a, it's a series of genetic pictures of all the bad decisions that a bacterium has made. The reason I'm here today and the reason you heard about CRISPR and the reason you should care about CRISPR is not the science behind it, which is great and interesting and mesmerizing, but it's because CRISPR can be repurposed as a genome editing technology. This is what was uh, originally um, recognized by the Gerner Foundation with the Gerner Prize that I had a great privilege to share with a few of my colleagues. And this is what was recognized last year by the Nobel Prize for Chemistry for, for Jennifer Doudna uh, for her work of repurposing CRISPR-Cas immune systems and developing genome editing technology. So two-step process, like a molecular scissor, molecular scalpel. We have the ability to use CRISPR to target DNA precisely and cut DNA at a predictable location. So think of the genome as a series of ATCs and Gs that equates to the complete works of Sir William Shakespeare. And you'd be able to say control F to be or not to be, that is the question. 
and slice DNA precisely between that and is, and then change the text right there. To be or not to be, that's the question. You can change a letter, you can add a word, to be or not to be the quintessential question, or you can take things out and change them, to be or not to be hashtag the question. So we now have the ability to use CRISPR-based technologies, and there's a whole toolbox of them that enables us to change the DNA, to be or not to be hashtag the question, also to change punctuation, how much or not genes are uh, tr transcribed and expressed. You can be very loud, to be or not to be, the question. Or you can be very quiet, turn things up, turn things down, turn things off, turn things on, change it. You can edit virtually the genome, the epigenome, and the transcriptome of any, virtually any organism on planet Earth. And as a matter of fact, this is what people have been doing. Those 200,000 labs in 100 countries around the globe in the past 10 years have been repurposing, deploying, testing, and harnessing this technology across the tree of life, the CRISPR zoo, to change the DNA of any organism you can think of, viruses, bacteria, yeast, and model organisms, some things you see at the zoo, right? The food and ag world, which is what I'm here to talk about, you know, food realm, Think not crisp chicken, but crisper chicken and mushrooms and tomatoes and livestock and crops and fruits and vegetables. And of course, medical applications as always critical to uh, model disease, understand disease and alleviate disease. So this is a very pictorial way to show you the power of CRISPR. As a matter of fact, the, the wing pattern of any one butterfly is unique on planet Earth. Much like the human iris, you can scan it, it's unique to one individual. No two butterflies have the same wing pattern. CRISPR is so powerful, you can take some cells out of this butterfly right here and direct CRISPR to find and change a gene called yellow, which is predictably responsible for the color yellow on the wing patterns of butterflies, and you can grow a whole butterfly out of that. That's why this one is smaller, which has the exact same wing pattern, but in which the color yellow has been removed. You can do that with different colors. You can recolor them from black to gray or white or on and on and on and brown. If we have the ability to use CRISPR to recolor the wing pattern of butterflies, I would argue there's no limit to what we can do technically, but our imagination. And as a matter of fact, this technology for genome editing has been applied across the world, across the tree of life, by 200,000 labs in 104 countries to change the research industry. There's all kinds of tools and kits and toys to do CRISPR, including in middle school, including in high school, including in your garage. A game changer. As a matter of fact, in the biotech industry, people who use bacteria and yeast and algae to make food enzymes, to make bioproducts like vitamins, to make medicines like insulin, to do things like oral care and healthcare and pet care and dishwasher detergents and washing machine detergents and biofuel have had their genome enhanced to be more efficient at doing so. Of course, in medicine, there's no limitation virtually to what we can pursue with CRISPR, not quite do yet, but pursue gene therapies, antivirals, infectious disease, antimicrobials, cell therapies, immunotherapies, on and on and on and on, diagnostics, big time right now. But today I'll talk a little bit about agriculture. We have the ability to use genome editing to breed next generation crops, to breed next generation livestock, to breed and engineer next generation bacteria we're using food fermentations. You can breed the forest. We can breed flowers and ornamentals and Christmas trees, CRISPR Christmas and seafood and aquaculture and on and on and on. As a matter of fact, just in the last five or six years, there's a whole plethora of CRISPR companies that have been spawned by this technology that are changing biotech that are changing food, that are changing ag, and that are changing medicine across the globe. As a matter of fact, there's already people deambulating the streets of North America and Europe 
who have had their genetic disease corrected with CRISPR technologies in a clinical setting. In the UK and in the US, there are people who have benefited already from clinical deployment of genome editing to correct, to edit the mistakes in their DNA that they inherited from one parent or both. Victoria Gray is a great example for sickle cell disease. You can look her up on Google. And of course, earlier this summer, there was great success in multiple patients for ATTR. And right now, there's about 46, 46, go to clinicaltrials.gov, 46 filing and INDs that are tracked, including 24 clinical studies that are actively recruiting for patients to test CRISPR medicines in humans. But I would argue if we deploy CRISPR to the fullest extent possible, we may save or improve the lives of 10 to 100 million patients in the next 10 years. That's great. That's fantastic. That's ambitious. That's noble. That's life-changing and life-saving. But if we could deploy CRISPR to the fullest extent possible in food and ag, we would benefit not 10 to 100 million, but 100 million to a billion plus people. And a matter of fact, to breed next generation crops, think of corn, wheat, soy, rice. If you look at fruits and vegetables, tomatoes, mushrooms, watermelon, bananas, Think of non-food crops used around the world, tobacco, cotton, hemp, trees and forestry. Think of all the nuts you eat that come from trees, right? Or sell those for bioenergy to replace fuel, alternatives to fuel. We have the ability to deploy those CRISPR-based technologies to breed the next generation of organisms that we use across the food supply chain. Cows that have no horn, so we don't have to cut them out. Dairy cultures that are more sustainable, so we can have better, more sustainable, better tasting, better flavored, better textured cheese. We can bring back the heirloom tomato. It tastes so much better. Or we can enrich the nutritional properties of fruits and vegetables. Not just make them taste better, but make them more nutritious to benefit our health. And it's not me saying it. It's the World Economic Forum saying it. The role of technology innovation in accelerating food systems transformation is critical right now. We need to feed a growing world, which today is having a very hard time doing so sustainably. We need to be more inclusive so the whole world can benefit from technology. We need to be more sustainable so we don't destroy the planet and we're more efficient with water and resources and with soil and with the food supply chain. We need to be more efficient and we need to be more nutritious and healthy. And CRISPR is a breeding game changer for ag. And as a matter of fact, if you look at the data and the metrics, this technology is predicted to generate up to $100 billion in additional farmer income. And we all understand how challenging farmer income has been. We can increase production maybe by 400 million tons across the globe. We can reduce micronutrients deficiency by up to $100 million. And as a matter of fact, the World Economic Forum predicts that up to 15% of all farms in the world, that's 100 million farms, will plant, predictably, a CRISPR gene-edited seed in the next nine years. Technically, in the next eight years and three months. And we're going to change the world by doing so. We're going to improve the efficiency, the safety, the nutritional value, and the sustainability of the ag enterprise. And beyond everything you can think of, a finite food that's in your plate or in your mouth or in your fridge or at the grocery store, in my lab and other labs, we work on microbiomes. And we work on improving, engineering, selecting, screening, and optimizing all the bacteria that live on, in, or around us in our oral cavity, in our GI tract, in our urogenital tract, in our skin, on our skin, but also same for livestock, same for plants, same for the ocean, same for soil, and last but not least, same for food. And as a matter of fact, humans have been using fermentation for millennia, long before we understood microbiology to ferment fermented beverages, to ferment vegetables, 
think sauerkraut and pickles and olives and kimchi and kombucha and think great fermented dairy products like yogurt and cheese or sausage and on and on and on and on. There's no limit to how much we can ferment foods to save it, make it more flavorful, make it more savory and make it more healthy. But with great technology and great potential also come great responsibility. How ethical is it to change DNA of other humans, of livestock, of plants, of trees, or a food supply chain? With great technology that's so powerful right now, are we going too fast? Do we really understand the consequences? Do we really understand the benefits? Do we really understand the risk? Are we going too slow because patients are dying? The earth is unsustainable. We have to address global warming and our food supply chain is very inefficient. So are we going too fast or too slow? Are we doing too much or too little? Do we have enough of a sense of urgency or not enough? And whose opinion matters and who regulates that? Of course, this is not just for the scientific community, it's also for the public. Are we ready to really understand and have a real debate about genetically modified organisms? Who would benefit from it? And is CRISPR genome editing genetic modifications? Whose voices matter? How can we ensure that we as a scientific community deploy CRISPR in a responsible, transparent, and innovative way? What are our values? Why are we doing this? Why am I doing this? How can we be using that disruptive technology to be better stewards of the planet and the farm and our food and water and trees and the forest? Not just to save lives, but to save the planet. What are the quantifiable or what are the fundamental philosophical benefits that we get from that? And then of course, how are regulators gonna manage that? Do we regulate medicines? The same way we regulate food, the same way we regulate livestock or crops. What are the risks for the consumer? What are the benefits for the consumer? What are the risks for the planet? What are the benefits for the planet? What are the risks for the farmers? What are the benefits for the farmers? What are the risks for governments? And what are the benefits from governments? There's a lot of discussions about this right now because however good science and technology is, in the era of COVID-19 and vaccines. A great product and a great technology can only be truly impactful when it is regulated and accepted by governments and by patients and consumers. And this is why talking more and more about stewardship and safety and efficacy and sharing stories with real farmers and real scientists to explain the benefits for the environment for the planet, for consumers, for patients, for water consumption? What are overall the consumer benefits with a safer, more sustainable, more environmentally friendly, more animal friendly, more transparent, more sustainable, more trustworthy, more responsible, use of disruptive technologies. How do we have the real dialogue without being polarized or dogmatic? How, what facts are important? What data is important? And whose opinion matters most? And this is why I kind of like being here today. This is why I look forward to all the thousand questions you may have about how do we do this? Because the science is hard, but there's a lot of very smart people throughout the world researching this investigating this, analyzing this, training the next generation of scientists who will deploy that in the real world, and also thinking about CRISPR, thinking about genome editing, thinking about ethics, thinking about consequences. And we have to work with governments. Politicians need to be educated. Regulators need to be educated. How are we going to patent this and license this and deploy this and manage this and trade this across borders? What are those regulations and limitations? Of course, we have to work with industry because to go from academia and basic research to an actual product, we need for-profit organizations, entrepreneurs, investors, strategic partners, 
commercial entities to actually make and manufacture products that will be distributed, hopefully globally and affordably, with equity in mind. And then last but not least, we have to work with the public. We have to work with consumers. We have to work with patients. We have to work with stakeholders. We have to work with the media now today more than ever. The news media, the print media, the online media, the social media. And of course, have opinions that are articulate, but also understandable, that are legitimate, but also relatable. And this is why I like being here so much as an educator. If you want to be a scientist, there's so many things you can do as a scientist. You can be a researcher, you can be a teacher, you can be a speaker, you can be an entrepreneur, you can be a learner for life, you can coach other people on how to do science, you can write forever about things you're passionate about, and you can administer research programs and research companies and research labs and universities. And this is why I'm so thankful to the Gardner Foundation. Not because they recognize my work or my contributions, but because they gave me the chance to spend a lot of time with amazing people. People who won the Nobel Prize, like Jennifer Doudna. People who are changing the world, like Feng Zhang. People who are saving lives, like Tony Fauci. People who have changed infectious disease in Africa, like Frank Plummer. And you have to find at least one scientist that you like and try to understand what happened in their life. Why are they your scientists? Why do they like? What are they passionate about? What do they care about? What motivates them? What are they dedicating their life to changing the world and advance science to benefit the rest of the world? Jennifer Diamond's story is fantastic. Read Walter Isaacson's The Code Breaker. Tony Fauci in 2016 was already a famous scientist. Now he's a famous and infamous public figure as well. But science is what motivates him. He's an amazing scientist who has developed therapies that have saved tens of millions of lives. And we have to remember people like Frank Plummer, other scientists who are maybe passed away and gone, but that dedicated their lives to changing the world, to saving people, right? Impacting and benefiting society. Very hard to do in this era of scientific skepticism. And that's why I'm thankful to be here. That's why I want to thank the Gardner Foundation. I want to thank Jesse. I want to thank you all and your teachers for taking the time out of their teaching hours to give you a chance to hear the exciting things that are going on in the crystal world, the amazing things that are going on in the crystal world, the life-changing, life-altering items that are going on in the crystal world that not just today, but tomorrow and for decades to come will benefit our lives, whether it's food, and food is great, and if we like to consume this food, hopefully three times a day, and it's nutritious and sustainable and health-promoting, but also agriculture, also forestry, also medicine, also biotechnology, and I hope that you find something that's interesting and intriguing enough to drive you to further your scientific interests, to look up CRISPR online, to ask a question, and to take your scientific career to the next level. So I will stop now and I will give Jesse a chance to moderate the Q&A from our distinguished and large audience today. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Beringer. That was fantastic. Uh, God, uh, what a fun program. Uh, if the classes don't have questions today, I have a ton. So I'm hoping that you guys are, are ready with questions in all your classes. We've got a whole whack of kids today. Uh, Texas, California, Michigan, Ontario, over 250 kids joining us around the world. Miss Waver, we've got the Laurel Springs School International School. So it's a really good time. Great audience today. And let's dive in. I'm going to kick us off with Notre Dame High School joining us, uh, Miss Gerard's class there in California. If you guys want to kick us off with a question, come on up and we'll dive right in. Hey guys. All right. Hi everyone. We're so glad to be back in the classroom. And this is my AP biology class. And um, their first question was, um, maybe you could share your one first goal or product that you and your team are hoping to bring to market. So we actually 10 years ago launched a commercial product that makes more sustainable and more efficient cheese. So we've been able to use CRISPR in a natural way in dairy cultures that ferment milk into yogurt and cheese and launched that in 2011. And earlier this year, we had the 10 year anniversary of the first launch of the first ever crystal product to make cheese more efficient and more sustainable. 
But of course, however cool cheese is and however tasty and enjoyable and however much I'm proud of this, I really think to me, saving lives is so much more rewarding, so much more life altering, so much more visceral and having been associated with entire therapeutics and seeing the clinical data that we can use CRISPR in humans to cure genetic disease and extend the life and, ex and improve the quality of life of patients comes second to none. I mean, saving lives is so critical, so impactful and hearing patients beg for treatments and now get a chance to benefit from science and technology to save lives. It's very, very hard to be. Yeah. And you highlight this. I'm going to put up the link to the movie that you shared a little clip of at the end of the broadcast so people can check that out. And I'll email it to all the teachers that registered today. We're at the end of the central feature of that film. Uh, I must say, personally, saving lives obviously is the, the you know, be all and end all of this. Cheese, I'm really glad you started with cheese. I'm a huge fan. I've got many kinds in my fridge right now. So thank you for that, for any contribution to that effort. Uh, let's head to Ms. James's class. Joining us in Stratford 8G. If you guys want to come up with a question, go for it. Hi everyone, um, this is Mrs. James's class. We're from Stratford, Ontario, and we have one of the students that would like to ask a question. So come on up, Grover, here, if you wanted to stand up here, go ahead. Uh, can, I, can it change a baby to not look like its parents? So can CRISPR actually change the DNA to not look like parents? So, I mean, it's not, it's not an obvious, clear, beneficial goal, uh, but there are traits that we have genetically that are encoded by our DNA that we inherit from our parents. Think eye color. So I mentioned, for instance, the ability of CRISPR to change the color of the wing patterns of butterflies. You could think that we could use DNA to change right, the color encoded in the retina that you have. So you have a different eye color that you don't inherit from your parents. That being said, though, given how hard it is, how expensive it is, and, and, and how clinically and medically relevant it is, right now, most people are really focusing on curing disease, not designing babies or children to change who they are or what they look like or what they do or how much they look like their parents or not. So technically, yes, there's no limit to what you can do with CRISPR. And also, I don't want to trivialize that. There's some traits that we have that we inherit from our parents that are encoded by tens, hundreds, and sometimes thousands of information and encoded pieces in our DNA and our genome. So for us to really make us not look like our parents, unless it's something simple like eye color or hair color, uh, if you really wanna change people's DNA to not look like your parents, you're gonna have to roll your sleeves all the way and do a lot of complicated, difficult, not always predictable things to do that. And in the end, the way you look doesn't define necessarily who you are. A lot of who we are depends upon our behavior, what we learn, how we socialize, how we communicate, how we interact. And a lot of those factors are not DNA encoded. So you can have mannerism that looks like you acquired from your parents, but you just learned it from them or you're learning from your grandparent or your siblings or your friends. And in the end, not everything is necessarily genetically encoded or only genetically determined. That was a very thoughtful answer to a unique question. I like that that's where your mind went. That was a, a different one for us. Uh, by the way, a small segue, I want to note in the back of that class in Stratford, you guys had apology, and I guess that's like one of the central tenets you want to instill in kids. Uh, being willing to admit mistakes and apologize is a really, really underserved thing in today's society, and I'm really impressed that you guys have that on your board. Uh, every student, every person should be willing to do that. I think that's a really important thing to have, so thank you guys for that. Uh, Miss Wafer joining us with Laurel Springs School. Again, it's so nice to have teachers back for the first time. This is our first week back. Uh, Miss Wafer, come on in and share on behalf of all your students everywhere. Just demute that mic and you're good to go. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I have a group of students on my second screen. We're a virtual school. And so I have questions coming in from Israel, California, Seattle, Richmond, Virginia. But I wanted to ask this question from Sam, who's an 11th grade student in Washington, D.C. He's read your paper with Dr. Dowda. And he has a question wondering what makes Cas the Cas9 sequence more popular than other gene sequences in the CRISPR family? 
Oh, excellent question. So, so Cas9 is the most popular, the favorite, the hot molecular machine. It's not the only one. There's others that are great. But what Cas9 does in terms of how efficient it is, how programmable it is, how safe it is, how big, it's actually small enough to put and deliver more easily um, is, is unmatched at this point in time. And think of it as multiple, because it's a molecular scalpel, think about it as multiple slicing devices you have in your kitchen. Different knives, a blender, an ax or a chainsaw, or you know, some kind of like you know, whacking sword. There's all kinds of CRISPR Cas systems in nature that do all kinds of things to DNA. But CRISPR is that Swiss Army knife that can do many things in general. And Cas9 is the easiest to use, easiest to yield. It's kind of precise, but also it can be heavy duty to some extent. So it's not like you're going to shave with an axe or do surgery with a chainsaw or use a blender necessarily to slice and chuck things. It's kind of that utility knife that enables us to be very flexible and very nimble and very efficient and very safe and doesn't have toxicity. So there's a lot of kind of like it's a look of the draw, right? It was one of the first effectors that was characterized in the Cas family, but it remains to date um, the favorite across the scientific community because it is very nimble, it is very deployable, it is very specific, and it is very efficient, and it makes it super valuable and convenient. I'm so glad we highlighted this. And again, you mentioned this at the beginning of your talk, this idea that it began with this investigation of the bacterial immune system. And I want to stress in all our detailed science talks, one of the things we get all the time is like, why invest in this? Why do basic research? Why spend the money? And there's the most classic example, everything you talked about in your presentation today, everyone that anyone can explore by looking at CRISPR more generally, began by an investigation on how basically bacteria fight off infections. Like what a, what a, uh, a bit of science that I mean to an outsider, if you were to hear that, why do that? Why bother? And look what it's led to. Look at what the understanding of information theory has led to with our computers that are, of course, everywhere. Everything that we do is based on computers now. So I think that that's a, CRISPR is not only an amazing technology in and of itself, but it's a testament to the power of basic research, which I think is one of the things we really like to stress here. So great question, guys. All right, uh, we're ripping through these. We've got time for our three more questions from our live classes. Miss Spicer's class, grade nines, uh, they're joining us today in Brantford, Ontario, right down the road from me. Unmute that mic and come on up, guys. There we go. Can't hear you just yet. Your mic's muted. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> Are you able to change the way that a baby's brain develops so that it's faster or like remembers things better? Yeah, so so there are a lot of people working on, uh, you know, brain power and brain health and brain function. And there's a lot of genetic diseases that impact brain function and knowledge and memory. So the answer is yes, there are efforts underway to use CRISPR and deploy CRISPR to understand brain function and disease and performance. But it's very, very complicated. And oftentimes there's multiple genes. Again, in this case, uh, schizophrenia or memory or data processing or performance or focus or concentration or data acquisition or data reminiscence. Or, so it, it's kind of not a low hanging fruit whatsoever. And then furthermore, outside of the conditions themselves, delivering things to the brain is very, very difficult. So delivering things in the blood, delivering things in the eye, delivering things orally or in muscles or in skin or certain organs like the liver or the kidney, to some extent, it's state of the art, I guess, in a lot of medical expert hands. But to change the brain and you want to go into neurons, Right. And you want to do like you have to do brain surgery in the first place to then deliver editing molecular machine that can change some neurons. And you want that to be efficient and specific enough that you change enough cells to have a cognitive gain. We're not there yet. Um, now, what CRISPR is doing right now in, in brain function is really understanding disease. And what we can do now is we can recapitulate some of the human gene sequences that seem to be associated with disease in animal models. 
So if there's a cohort of people that have schizophrenia and we sequence their genomes and we see, oh, the people who have schizophrenia have this mutation and the people who don't have it don't have this sequence, then we can take that mutation and then generate that mutation in the brain of an animal model, like a mouse or a rat or a chimp. And then now we can analyze and investigate that in a medically relevant model to understand how we can improve schizophrenia or how we can improve memory, or how we can improve the speed of brain development and on and on and on. But at this point in time, using CRISPR to enhance the speed of brain development into babies, we are very far from that. And it's such a high hanging fruit that it's going to take us a while to get there. Yeah. I think uh, in a lot of programs like this, when we talk about biomedicine, the brain is always something that gets brought up. And I think it's worth noting, it's the most complex machine in the universe. Like there's nothing that competes with the brain. We are still at the very early stages of understanding, much less working to modify brain and cognition and understanding of consciousness. Um, but it's a really neat question. So I'm so glad we got it brought up. All right, guys, two more questions. Miss Balls class, joining us in Goddard, grade 10s, come on up. And then we'll end with Miss Leeds in Stratford in just a minute. So unmute that mic and you guys are good to go, grade 10s. There we go, and there we go, perfect. I was just wondering what, uh, when CRISPR hit the media, lots of things happened. I just wondered what you thought might be the biggest misconception about CRISPR in the media. Oh, that I could talk about that for a whole other hour. So I, I think, you know, like lack of trust in the scientific enterprise is just mind boggling. Like people think are, Scientists are using CRISPR to do crazy things like CRISPR babies or enhancing intelligence or changing traits or changing the way we look or whether we look like our parents or not, like our siblings or not. Like, like, like there's, there's thousands of genetic diseases that we can use CRISPR and deploy CRISPR with to alleviate pain and suffering in humans. And that's what most people are doing. So I think what drives people is very important. And oftentimes it's misconstrued because people want sensational drama media friendly short bits oh those crazy people are trying to revive the wally mammoth and it's jurassic park and gattaca or those people want to have designer babies like you're going shopping and you can you know snip a few pieces of dna so you can pick the color of your child and their their eye and you know what their face looks like and whatnot and you know it's not quite we're not, we're not quite doing that another thing is you know, people always equate DNA manipulating technologies to GMOs. And when we, when we breed food, when we breed livestock, when we breed crops, it's very inefficient and time consuming. And we can actually use CRISPR to accelerate the natural process. And we're not generating transgenic, like when you put a fish gene into a tomato to make it cold resistant. Or we're not going to, you know, have like Franken foods and take crazy genes from a crazy species and then have hybrid species that are unnatural. There's a lot of ways to use CRISPR to replicate natural processes and natural outcome, but make it more efficient, make it more precise and make it much faster. So when we breed a tree, we don't need to wait for 16 years for maturity and then go through the breeding process and then try something we can do it maybe in 12 months. The same outcome, they will be genetically indistinguishable. They're not transgenic and on and on and on. I think a third, a third thing that, that is concerning right now, when we look at the context of vaccines and anti-vaxxers, GMO and non-GMO, pro-science and anti-science, sadly, I think a lot of the media, a lot of the attention, a lot of the messaging is around you know, distrust in science, distrust in scientists, distrust in companies that develop technologies. When we look at history, the history of medicine, medicine and drugs would not be developed without team science. So antibiotics and vaccines and agriculture and diagnostics and uh, technology that we wear all day, every day, whether it's your phone or your watch, or your computer or your device you're working on, all those things are based on, as Jesse mentioned, like an early scientific discovery or investigation that yields technology that's beneficial and commercializable, that benefits patients, consumers, and on and on and on. And I think 
I'm confused by where this lack of understanding and trust for science comes from. Most scientists dedicate decades of their career to selflessly solve other people's problems, whether it's disease, whether it's technology, whether it's diagnostics, whether it's food, whether it's ag, whether it's biotech, whether it's going to space, whatever you, whatever technology you can think of, you know, computers and the internet and like, this is what team science does. And we do a very poor job in the media in particular, articulating all the benefits that people get from science. And in the, in the desire to have a balanced narrative in the media, you're going to have a pro CRISPR, anti CRISPR, pro vaccine, anti vaccine pro-science, anti-science, pro-GM, anti-GM, under the premise that we're going to have some kind of balanced take in a five or three or two minute segment on TV to let the public decide why science is good or bad. And I think we're not really doing justice to the scientific enterprise to really understand all the benefits we get from that and the millennia of scientific knowledge, rigorous scientific method that goes through that and if you think of diagnostics for a minute, I mean, that's the FDA's job in the U.S. and Health Canada and Canada and others in Europe, EFSA in Europe, to really ensure that once the products become commercialized, it's safe and it's efficacious. And, they, and it's data informed. There's no, there's no magic to it. There's no mystery to it. It's very transparent. It's very data driven. And I'm always kind of, perplexed by the ability or the willingness or the desire of the media to kind of question how science works. Like those of you who take chemistry and physics, it's very binary. There's no like the reaction work or didn't work. The enzyme work didn't work. The chemical is there or it's not. I mean, like, like it's scientific driven. Matter exists. Antimatter can be managed. The speed of light. Like, there's no debate. You don't know, like, well, I think the light is going faster. Well, I think light is going slow. Well, I mean, you can impact that to some extent, but there is a speed of light. Atoms are atoms. The table of the elements, the table of the elements. There's no debate or vote of like, do we agree or not agree? So I think to me, in the media, that's the biggest challenge that we have. And whether it has something to do with science or not is, is a question. And I think scientists today who are articulate and motivated enough to take that battle on should absolutely do it. Because unless we address that one challenge, great technologies, great medicines, great science, great discoveries, great molecular machines, great products may not benefit the patients, the consumers, the planet, or even you know the cosmos as much as it could based on things that are not necessarily science-driven or articulated. Now, that being said, though, we have also to understand that the public will have an opinion that may not be science informed. And there's religious aspects to it. And there's ethical aspects to it. And there's equity aspects to it. And there's access to technology aspects to it. And there's safety and there's trust and there's values. And I think it's complicated, but science itself because of the scientific method and the scientific enterprise and the scientific foci and the internal criticism that scientists subject themselves to and their results to and their work to should be trusted a little bit more. And the, the anti-science bias should be managed uh, more efficiently than it is right now. Yeah. That was a thoughtful and beautiful answer. We could do a program on that exact topic all year long. I mean, we are standing in the wake of a time where vaccines are developed within a year, have saved tens of millions of lives. It's the greatest scientific accomplishment in 100 years. And yet there's a lot of pushback to that because of, you know, this nature of experts, this nature of trying to balance perspectives. And I'm so glad you touched upon all of that today. Thank you so, so much for that. Um, I want to dive in with our last question. I know we're a little over time, but I think all you guys are with me and, and you know, being very vested in all this and very excited about it all. Uh, so Ms. Lee's class, if you want to wrap us up with one more question, come on in. And uh, again, thank you very good for that answer. That was great. Okay. Hey guys. I think I need to <laughs> no, you're good. You're all set. <laughs> all right. Um, what might a benefit be to recreating extinct animals with CRISPR? Yeah, so, so as we know, sadly and tragically, 
there's a lot of things that are going on in the world that are driving species to be extinct. And as a matter of fact, if global warming keeps the way it is and our water access and our energy use and our carbon captures keep going the way things are going right now, up to 30% of all species on planet Earth will be extinct in short order. And that's just like fundamentally unacceptable. So we have the ability to use CRISPR technologies to ensure or to attempt to some extent to prevent species extinction in the first place, make them more resilient and more amenable and accelerate adaptation to some extent, otherwise they go extinct. Or we also could deploy those technologies to de-extinct species and maybe bring them back to the world. So think of about um, pandas, right? Maybe we can use CRISPR to breed more pandas or breed pandas more efficiently or some species of tigers or species of or corals, corals that are dying because of pollution in water, we could maybe enhance the genetic content to some extent to make them more resilient to oil spills or toxic plastic or photo bleaching because the, the water uh, depth is changing and those corals do not get the amount of sun that they like or they need to survive. So I think there's a lot of, of preventing extinction in the first place. Think of a preventative, uh, prophylactic, so to speak, course of action, or there's a cure. We're gonna de, de extinct species, bring them back to life using genome editing technologies. So we could take a woolly mammoth like George is doing right now, and then try to implant this into a species of elephant that's compatible to see if we can bring back a species that only a few tens of thousands of years ago was really benefiting the tundra. So I think, you know, but don't, don't just think of like mammals and Jurassic Park, think of fish species and bird species and bacterial and microbial species and coral species and insect species and tree species and food and crop species that we have to really ensure that we keep so we have the biodiversity that we need we have the food supply chain that we need and we have the environmental conditions that we need yeah i'm so glad we got that question from a conservation angle i'm glad you mentioned the idea of working with existing species to try and make them more resilient to climate change and other impacts that we are putting on them so i, I really appreciate all of this this has been a really fantastic presentation before we bring in all the classes to say a quick goodbye, I want to highlight a few notes for you guys to keep the learning going. One, I know this is a bit unwieldy, but this is Dr. Rangu's lab. If you guys want to check that out, see more of his work, of course, you can Google him as well. Lots of great stuff there. The book that he mentioned for our older students, if you want to learn more from one of the best biographers in the world, The Codebreaker by Walter Isaacson. Amazing read. Check that out. Everything by Isaacson's awesome. And if you want to see that Human Nature film, so Human Nature on Netflix, there's the full thing, Wonder Collaborative helped produce the film. It's an amazing program. I really encourage all our classes to check it out. Finally, of course, this is a Gairdner Foundation, Gairdner Awards program. Check out Gairdner.org to see all their laureates. Again, we highlighted Jennifer Dudno, we highlighted Tony Fauci, some other amazing people alongside Dr. Barrett that have been lauded by the Gairdner Foundation. And if you want to see two more programs coming up, September 20th and 27th on more amazing biomedical stuff, Dr. Jeff White and Dr. Lewis K coming up in just a little bit. I encourage you guys to sign up. They're going to be some really fantastic programs on blood and protein, so some neat, neat stuff. Uh, Dr. Barry, we thank you so much for joining us today. This is a real pleasure. And what I'm going to do is bring in everyone. I'll bring in all our classes and say goodbye. Miss James, Miss Gerard, Miss Spicer, Miss Bull, Miss Leany, and Miss Waver. Thank you guys for joining us. Hey. Have a good rest of the day, everyone.